All right. Well, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Yunus Lari. I am an alumnus of Florida Coastal School of Law, uh, an admissions counselor in the Office of Admissions, uh, and your host today. Some of you have been in contact with me um, and have talked to me before and have uh, seen me before. Uh, I just want to uh, thank all of you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to be with us today. Uh, these webinars have been um, growing in popularity and uh, that encourages my colleagues and I uh, to keep bringing you the materials you want to hear uh, more about. Today, however, uh, we are going to discuss Florida Coastal School of Law. I first encountered the name when I was exploring my options for a law school to attend which is most likely the position that many of you are in as we speak. Uh, I spoke to their ambassador um, at a law firm in my undergrad school in University of Utah, Go Utes. Uh, this was in 2011. A year later, in August of 2012, I started law school here in beautiful, sunny Jacksonville, um, uh, with Florida Coastal School of Law as a part of the class of 2015. One of the best decisions I've ever made to this day. Uh, a lot has changed since my classmate, uh, classmates and I started our law school journey. And of course, um, much, much, much more uh, has changed since Florida Coastal School of Law first opened its doors uh, to uh, the school's uh, very first incoming class Back in 1996, it's been over 20 years, uh, change, evolution, and adapting to the, uh, to the ever-shifting field of legal education is exactly what you would expect uh, from a law school that National Jurist Magazine ranked among the top innovative law schools in the nation in 2013. Today, we're going to briefly go over some of that exciting history and more importantly, talk about the changes and upgrades that are in the making uh, these days, discussing the direction that the school is taking, uh, why you should care, and why uh, now might be the best time to join the very dynamic family of uh, coastal law. I know that sounds like a lot, but thankfully, I have the perfect guest speaker today uh, to tell us all about it. My guest speaker today is not Dean Tony Cardenas, unfortunately. I know his name was mentioned in our email invitations for uh, the webinar. Um, like I said, unfortunately, due to a last-minute scheduling conflict, uh, Tony had to cancel. Uh, he, um, he, he said hi to every single one of you and apologized for the uh, inconvenience and the conflict, uh, especially to Tony's fans out there. Uh, I know he has a few, but fear not. Uh, when Tony canceled, I knew immediately who would be just the perfect substitute. And uh, I asked her, and lucky for us all, as she graciously accepted. Uh, my guest speaker today is my friend and colleague, senior admissions counselor in the Office of Admissions, Ms. Megan Shade. Megan also attended Florida Coastal and has been deeply involved with this school since uh, she graduated and passed the bar. She is our to-go expert in the Office of Admissions, and if there is anything to know about Florida Coastal, she is the one who does. I hope you guys enjoy her presentation as much as uh, my colleagues and I enjoy working with her. Uh, as always, I encourage uh, all of you to ask questions. Uh, you can use the chatting box on the side of your screen to type in your questions and we'll do our best to answer them. In fact, uh, in order to familiarize you guys with the chatting box, why don't you all go ahead and type in um, where you're all uh, joining us from uh, this evening and uh, we'll, get that, we'll get that going. Now, without any further ado, I give you Miss Megan Shake. Megan, it's all yours. All right. Thank you so much, Eunice. Um, welcome, everybody. We are so glad to have you here uh, this evening with us. And I know you would love for me to be Dean Cardenas, but like Eunice said, um, unfortunately, he had a conflict and was unable to make it. 
Um, so I'm hoping that I can answer all of your questions, give you some really good insight into where Florida Coastal has been and where we're going. Uh, Eunice, I think I'm going to need your help because I forget how to put my slides. Aha, he knew exactly what I needed. Um, I'm going to go off webcam just so that you guys can focus on all the information that I have on the slides here. But um, thank you to everybody who has been letting us know where we're at. That's going to help me cater the conversation a little bit tonight. If you have any questions throughout, like Eunice mentioned, please ask them. I will also take questions at the end. Uh, who knows? I might even throw in a question while uh, we are going through this to make sure um, you guys are kind of with me and that I'm giving you the information you're looking for. Um, can everybody hear me? I do have someone that says they can't hear us. Um, so I just wanna make sure that you can hear me. Um, okay, perfect. So uh, to those who can't, I would just say, check your speakers, check and make sure you don't have uh, it muted so that you can get all the information um, that I'm gonna be providing here. So I am gonna go off webcam just so that I can get started and give you some information this evening. All right, so to get started, um, we're here to talk about why Coastal, why now? Uh, as Eunice mentioned, I am also a graduate of Florida Coastal School of Law. I graduated in 2013. I started in 2010 when law school was booming, um, that lots of students were deciding that law school was the thing that they wanted to do. Um, and the market was really great for that. Everybody was kind of going into law school um, and that landscape has changed over the years. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that, um, but just that's the thing to consider and think about when you're going to law school. If this is an ever changing market um, and there's so many different things that you can do as a law student. So I really encourage you to just think about what you want to do and really go for it. So to start out with, of course, to get to the future, to get to where we are today, we do have a pass. So um, here on the screen, you'll see Florida Coastal School of Law in our old building. So as Eunice mentioned at the beginning, Florida Coastal School of Law was established in 1996. The reason Florida Coastal was established was because we felt like, and there was, a lack of diversity in the legal field. And in order to help in that area, our founders decided that we are going to start Florida Coastal School of Law. And this law school is going to help those students who want to make a difference in other people's lives and allowing a more diverse legal uh, market, more diverse legal students, more diverse legal studies to occur. So to give you a little bit more about that and kind of what our foundation is, is Florida Coastal is based on three different pillars, and those pillars are student outcome centered. So looking at our students and what they're doing while they're here, ensuring that they are prepared for the bar exam and ensuring that the culture that they have is one that is embracing them and making them the best attorneys that they can be. Our second pillar is serving the underserved. So that is ensuring that we are doing what we intended and set out to do. We want to help the legal market we want to ensure that diversity in, you know, continues to be something that is important and recognized and that everybody has a voice. And we're going to talk about that a little bit, or I guess I'm going to talk about it a little bit when I go into kind of what we're doing now. Um, but that just gives you a foundation of where we are. Our third pillar is practice ready, ensuring that our students are ready to go out and be attorneys once they graduate. So all of these three pillars that I'm talking about, you will hear throughout this conversation, throughout the information that I'm providing to you because it is our foundation, it is our culture. It is things that we talk about every day in ensuring that we provide our students with the best services that we can. We are unlocking that human potential. We are ensuring that you are successful and that you get what you wanted to get out of your legal education. So a little bit more about the past. What did, when did it all happen? So we talked about 1996. Here's a picture of our charter class. They graduated in 1999. And the thing that you have to think about is students who started in this charter class had to have a passion for law. They had to have this feeling of taking a chance because that's what they did. They took a chance on Florida Coastal because when a law school starts, 
we don't have accreditation. We don't have everything that we need. We need our students to be there and support us. We need our faculty to be there and support us. We need our administration to be there that believes in our mission. And that's what we had right from the beginning. We had people here on our campus who said, Florida Coastal is going to make a difference. And these 60 students, we had 60 students start in our first class. They took advantage of an opportunity that was provided to them and they are now thriving. We have over 5,000 alumni who are thriving due to the education that they got here at Florida Coastal School of Law. So we're talking about how we started in 1996. Well, here we are. Um, this picture was taken a couple years ago as we were ramping up to celebrate our 20th anniversary. Florida Coastal School of Law is a young institution, but with young institution comes the opportunity to be modern, to be cutting edge, to take advantage of those things that some of our you know, sister law schools, I'm gonna call them, our law schools that have been around for a while are more of the historic law schools. They have that character, but we have that modern character. So it's really great to step into a classroom, step into a building that has been around for 20 years, that has been here when you had access to the internet, that has been through the changes in social media and different things that is impacting the legal market. So it's really exciting to be a part of that. We were really excited to celebrate our 20th anniversary. Um, some of you might have received information regarding our Bicennial Scholarship that was created last year in celebration um, of those students and our accomplishments thus far. We do have a foundation, um, and every year we post what's called Founders Day. And this photo that I have up there right now was actually taken um, during Founders Day for the celebration of our 20th anniversary. All right, so the present. Where are we right now? So Eunice and myself are currently located right here off Bay Meadows in Jacksonville South Side at Florida Coastal School of Law. Of course, there's not as much clouds and blue skies. If you saw behind us when we were both on webcam, or at least behind me, it is currently raining. It does look like some of you um, are here in Jacksonville as well. So you're probably experiencing the fun thunderstorms that we have and the rain that happens, uh, you know, pretty much every day. Um, but this is where we are right now. So let's talk about what is the present? What is Florida Coastal doing now? What do you need to know about? And how are we using this to propel us into the future? So right now, Florida Coastal School of Law is very proud of itself. And we're really proud of the admissions team because this is something that Honestly, Dean Cardenas and the dean and president of the law school have really been focusing on, and we feel that it's really important to our students and something that we want to ensure that we are sharing with everybody who is willing to listen. So over the last year, Florida Coastal School of Law has increased their median LSAT score by five points. Actually, scratch that. We've increased our bottom quartile by five points. Our median has not quite jumped that same amount. It's close to that, but not exactly the same as five points. But the important thing regarding this is that is a huge accomplishment. Um, if you have done any research into law schools and things um, in regards to numbers, it's really tough to increase something that rapidly over a year. And it's something we're very proud of because although um, how many of you have taken the LSAT? I'll, I'll kind of continue while I ask that question. But I, it, you know, the LSAT is something that some students just kind of dread. And I'll, I'll be honest, that was something that I dreaded when I was getting ready to go to law school because it's another standardized test. Um, and what happens is, you know, some students have nerves over it. And some students just, just don't test well. So it's really great to see this increase in the LSAT because it was one of our goals. It also allows us to bring in those students who are going to be successful in law school. Unfortunately, the LSAT is a really great indicator of how well not only are you going to do in your first year, but how well you're going to do overall. And when you finally get to that final exam, you get done with finals, right? And you're like, oh, I graduated from law school. You go to law school graduation. And then I remember the next day I was like, I have to study for the bar exam. And 
The LSAT is a great indicator for the bar exam as well. So we are very proud of increasing that LSAT score. For those of you who have not taken the LSAT, we wish you the best of luck. We encourage you to reach out to us, get advice, whether it's from us or from someone else, as you prepare for that exam, because it is really important um, when determining where you're gonna go to law school, the law schools that you're gonna get into, and the success that you will have here at Florida Coastal School of Law. So with that higher LSAT score, we are bringing in a higher quality class. We are bringing in students who are a part of our mission. They are mission driven. They want a smaller law school. They want leadership opportunities. They want the opportunity to make a difference. And that's what we are building through our class here at the present time. So next, moot court success. So this is something that if you haven't heard us talk about, we talk about a lot. We are very proud of our Moot Court team. And as you'll see just this past weekend, they um, participated in their first competition of the season. And we sent two teams. Um, if only they didn't face off against one another, um, really, I guess, kind of in the second or third round, um, they would have hopefully both made it very far. But we were very proud of our team who won first in this competition. Uh, Florida Coastal's Moot Court team has been very successful. It's been recognized for the success that it has. In the last decade, we are ranked third in the nation. We were national Moot Court champions in 2014 and 2015, I believe, were the two years. Um, so it's a really great program, but we have opportunities beyond that. It's not just about Moot Court. It's about what are you doing as a student outside of the classroom? I talked a little bit at the beginning, and I think Eunice mentioned it, about experiential learning and ensuring that students are getting that experience before they even step foot into their first job. We want you to figure out what it's like. 100% of our students participate in pro bono legal work prior to graduation. The national average is only 65%. We require our students to do pro bono that first year. It is actually part of a graduation requirement. And then we also recommend that you get at least 400 hours of legal work experience while you're in law school. This will only help and ensure that you are successful upon graduation. There are many different things that you can do, many ways to get involved, and we are continually providing information to our students on that information and the op on the different opportunities so that you can become a part of that third pillar, being practice ready. We are focusing on that first pillar, being student outcome centered. We want to ensure you have the best legal education possible so that when you are done here, you can go on and be successful attorneys. Now, the next thing I'm going to mention is something that we've been toying around with for a while because it's something that we feel our students are always doing. We are continually doing pro bono work. We are continually helping those in our community. So our focus going into this next year is really owning what we are and what our students participate in and really owning this idea of social justice looking at the society, looking at the distribution of wealth and opportunity and privileges within that society and ensuring that everyone has a voice. You'll see, you know, there's lots of different words here on this graphic that I chose. And, you know, our clinics are working with many different people who are coming in, whether it's through our immigration clinic or our family law clinic, and they need a voice. And that's what our students are. They are that voice for someone who might not be able to be that voice themselves. They are helping translate when someone comes into the country and cannot speak the language, but needs to get information across, needs to get questions answered. Our students are there to help. They're doing great things, not only while they're here as a student, but when they graduate. All of our students have done great things, I talked about our anniversary. The, another important thing about our 20th anniversary was at that time, our students had participated in more than a million hours of donated legal services. So this is students in our clinic, students participating in our numerous pro bono opportunities, um, students participating in externships, 
it's everything that you do while you're here as a student to give back to the community. And it's not necessarily giving back to the Jacksonville community. Some of you are on here from other places. Let's say, I think someone said they're from New Orleans. Let's say you want to go back there after you graduate. Um, you want to be giving back to that community during that time while you're in law school um, and beyond. So we really encourage our students to do that. And it's, it's really exciting to see the numerous things that can be done. Um, so we hope that that's something you're interested in, that one of the reasons you want to go to law school is to make a difference, is to empower those who might feel powerless, is to develop and enhance the things that are happening, to embrace change and be at the forefront of change and ensuring that there is justice for all. Um, so we, this is something we're really passionate about. You're going to be hearing so much more about it if you continue to talk to us. Um, but I just wanted to show you that that's our present, that's our now, that's our focus. It's always been our focus, but now we're going to be telling you all about it um, for all that will listen. All right, so I have to do it. I have to talk about the law school landscape. And instead of talking about it in our past and in our present and in our future, I figured let's just cover it one time. So as I mentioned at the beginning, when I started law school, uh, there were lots of us going to law school. The law school landscape was different. A lot of students were applying to go to law school, were getting into law school, and then I'll be honest, when we're getting ready to graduate, there's only so many jobs and so many areas that are available. So it can sometimes be a little tough to find that you know really important job, the thing that you're really looking for. So that's why when I was talking about getting that experience when you're a student, it's really important for when you're done and you're going to start your career. But what does the landscape look like now? I'm going to tell you, the landscape has changed. I've been working for Florida Coastal School of Law for four years, and the law school landscape has changed. There are less people going to law school. Yes, you heard me. There are less people going to law school. The landscape is smaller. It is not what it used to be three years ago. It's not what it used to be six years ago. Lawyers are needed. They are needed very much so. Without getting into any, anything when it comes to politics, there's lots of things going on in our nation today. There's a lots of different opinions, and us as attorneys have to embrace that conflict to some degree and ensure that we are providing both sides of both sides of the argument. That's our job as attorneys is to understand. And right now, I know there's some things that a lot of us are like, oh, nope, I, I, I believe it this way. This is my belief. But I will tell you, when you go to law school, you will learn to look at all situations from every angle possible. That is one of the great things about law school. You will become someone who can see a situation from every different angle and play devil's advocate, as you sometimes hear when you're having conversation with your family and friends. It is a wonderful time to go to law school. Like I said, the landscape is smaller. And I'm going to tell you, I think that it's probably going to stay like this for a while. Just think about it. Um, many of you, my parents included, are, you know, getting to the age where they're going to start retiring. And a lot of those are the baby boomers. So when our baby boomers start retiring, there's going to be positions open. And definitely in the legal field, there are always going to be a need for attorneys. So I really encourage you to watch the landscape, see what's happening. You might be interested in starting law school this upcoming term, but you might be interested in starting law school in a year or two. So it's really important to look at that. It's something to embrace. Because the, the law school landscape right now is good. There's going to be jobs. Um, there's going to be places for you to make that difference that you want to make. So I encourage you to embrace that and be a part of it and take advantage of those opportunities. Remember, I'm going to keep going back to our mission. We're unlocking that student potential. We're unlocking that human potential. We want to provide excellence to our students so that they get a professional education that is top notch in the century. We're focusing on you as a student. And 
for us to understand the law school landscape and know where it's going and where it's been and where it's going to go is so important. And if you ever have any questions about the law school landscape and understanding it at all, please let any of us know. It's something that we pretty much live and breathe every day um, and understand to see what the impact is going to have on you. All right, the future. The future truly depends on what we are doing now. What Florida Coastal School of Law is doing now, increasing our credentials, continuing to be successful in moot court and all of the opportunities that we have for our students, embracing social justice, taking a look at what the law school landscape is, is going to help us in the future. We are so proud of the 20 some years now that we have had this law school. We have been located in now two locations and there's the potential for a third. Some of the things in our future could be moving our location. Now, some of you might be like, Megan, I'm getting ready to start. Don't tell me you're gonna move. It's not, it will be to your benefit if we move. The move would be to, to go get towards downtown. Right now, Florida Coastal School of Law is located 15 to 20 minutes from the downtown area. This would allow you to be closer to the legal market. It would be a good thing for you, but that is something that is in our future. It is looking to what we are going to be doing in the future. Another thing that I can not, not mention is our move towards not-for-profit. Florida Coastal School of Law is currently a for-profit institution, but we have been working for, oh gosh, it's probably been at least six months on changing that. So our administration is working on making us a not-for-profit school. Uh, whether that means we are going to partner with another university or we are going to do it on our own, it is something that we are moving full speed ahead on. We feel that it's something that's going to be very successful for our future. It's going to help our students, help um, the landscape of the legal market, and just help the understanding of what we do as an institution. Like I said, we're really focused on helping others, serving the underserved, social justice, and our plan to move towards nonprofit is just one more step that is going to assist us in those goals to helping you be a successful student. Um, stay tuned, it's something they're working on. It's something that will be happening when it happens. Um, I know, I see a question. Will this plan happen by or in 2018? Great question. So I don't know. The process for changing a school from for-profit to non-profit is not short. It's pretty lengthy. Um, you have to get approval from many governing agencies, including not only the ABA, but the Department of Education. And then um, there's some uh, Florida specific um, regulations that we have to ensure we're in line with as well. It's something that they're really pushing for. It could happen in the next year, but we really don't have a specific deadline. And I'll tell you, Linda, that's something we ask um, all the time as well is, you know, what are we, you know, when is this going to happen? Uh, when will it happen? How soon will it happen? And things like that. Um, so when we have more information, uh, we will definitely ensure that that information is provided to you as well. Um, Adam, I see a question from you as well. What is the benefit for, for the students if the school is nonprofit? Um, so there are a lot of different benefits. And I, Eunice, please, if you have any insight in, in this as well, feel free to, feel free to jump in. Um, but so it's different models. So, you know, for-profit model is more business driven. Well, the nonprofit model is more of a, organization, it can help us focus more um, on your, um, sorry, I'm reading the text box and trying to talk at the same time, um, focus more on our students. Nonprofit kind of sets the tone of being more towards the students than necessarily um, the business model of everything. So it's, it's definitely beneficial to our students. There's different things that come into play when you're a for-profit versus a nonprofit institution. There's different regulations that um, impact students at a for-profit law school that are not in play at a nonprofit. It's a lot of different things. Eunice, I see you came on. Do you have anything else to add to that? 
Uh, real quick, uh, just in addition to what you already mentioned, I just wanted to talk about the regulations uh, as far as the institution is concerned. Uh, when an uh, institution is uh, not for profit, uh, the regulations are uh, slightly different. Uh, when it comes to different reportings we have to do to the Department of Justice, DOJ, or uh, reporting we have to do to ABA, um, there are just uh, different levels of scrutiny. Uh, for uh, for-profit institutions and non-for-profit institutions. As it stands now for us, for for-profit institutions, we are actually under a higher level of scrutiny uh, in terms of our reportings and in terms of uh, many different things when it comes to communicating with our prospective students and our admitted students. I just wanted to add that um, on top of everything else you already mentioned, uh, Megan. No, thank you, Yunus. And I hope that answers the question, to, to be honest, when it comes to Unis and my role in it, it's very minimal. This is something we're kind of told is going to happen, um, and it's really the administration that is working through all of it. To be honest, we probably have as many questions that, as you have when it comes to um, this, you know, the impact that we will have. But I will tell you, Adam, it's going to be more of a benefit to you as a student than the for-profit model, just because of the different regulations and the scrutiny that Enos has mentioned. All right, and I apologize if my, I feel like my voice may be getting a little hoarse here, um, but I am almost done, I promise you that. Um, see, I, I told you I was almost done. So um, we are here to answer any other questions. That's kind of where we've been and where we are going. Um, it looks like we have a couple other questions and, and I'm happy to answer them. If you have any information that you need, I have our main admissions information. I have my information here, um, but I'm happy to take any questions. Um, it looks like our, uh, so the next question we have is, are federal student loans available to students of a for-profit school? Yes, federal student loans are available to students at a for-profit institution. All graduate students are offered the um, Stafford loan, and then students also can apply for the Graduate Plus loan. Um, but the financial aid process is available for all, um, you know, private or public for-profit, um, not-for-profit law schools um, in the country. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Does anybody have any other questions about anything that I talked about or something that I didn't talk about that you that you want to know about? The one thing I do want to mention, I know I talked about diversity at the very beginning. Um, and diversity is something that the school is still moving forward to all the time. Um, the last couple of years, we've won the HEAT Award, which recognizes schools for their commitment to diversity. Um, we have a wonderful director of diversity and inclusion here on campus who constantly brings people onto campus to expose us to things that we don't know about. That's the wonderful thing, and I'm going to come back on the webcam here. That's the wonderful thing about law school. Everybody that you are going to encounter probably has a different experience, is, is brought up a different way, has a different thought process, um, and it really enriches the classroom, and it allows you to be a better student. It allows you to learn from, you know, the student that might be sitting next to you that has 20 plus years of maybe working in the police force and now coming to law school, or someone who has, you know, just come out of undergrad, um, but they are moving from Ohio, like I did, here to Jacksonville to go to law school. Um, it's really a great environment, um, and there's a, a lot of stuff that you will be exposed to as a law student. Um, I have another question. It says, what was the other loan type mentioned? Oh, so the other no loan type that I mentioned was the Graduate Plus loan. So the Graduate Plus loan is provided to students. Um, you apply for it, and it helps pay for maybe the additional cost of tuition and living expenses. Um, it's kind of like a parent loan in undergrad. It just allows you to take out additional funds to help cover those costs. Does anybody have any other questions about our past, about our current situation, the present, or where we're going in the future that I can answer for you?
Okay. Megan, do you want to take this uh, this other question? Oh yes, yeah. sorry, I just saw it. How do, so the question is, how does the spring semester start work in terms of in most schools, everyone starts in the fall and everyone has essentially the same schedule. So um, what happens is when students start in the spring term, they are going to take the same classes that our fall students start. And those students who start in the spring are required to take summer classes that first summer. Uh, the reason we do that is to try to get you as close in line as our fall students. Now, you're not going to be 100% there, um, but we do that in hopes that if you do start in the spring, then by the fall, you just have a couple more of the re required first year courses, and then you're also in some of your elective courses as well. So it is going to be that same schedule. Um, it's going to be a smaller class size, so sometimes students like that, but really, you're not a large law school. Um, this fall, we're going to be bringing in probably around 75 students in our fall class. Um, the, the spring class will more than likely be around 30 students. So just to kind of give you an idea of the size of the classes. Um, Thomas, I hope that answers your question. If you have a follow-up, feel free to type it. Um, Linda, I see, do you have a specific place downtown yet? The answer is I have no idea. Um, so when it comes to the move to downtown, um, that's something that our president and dean are working on, and they really don't tell us anything until they know for sure, um, just because they want to ensure that they don't tell us one thing and then it ends up being another. Um, so as soon as we get more information, um, you know, they, we will definitely get that, that out to you. Um, but I know that there are some places that you're, they're looking at and considering um, so far, we also are currently in a building um, that we have to, you know, ensure that someone's here to take over as well before we're able to make move downtown. Tyler, when are you, when are you going to start accepting applications for the fall? Very, very soon. Our fall application will go live on September 1st. So make sure you're on the lookout for that. You'll be able to um, start applying at that time. Do we have any other questions about anything at all, whether it's about what we talked about or, you know, you're interested in starting in the next year and you want to know um, any advice or any information that might be helpful that me and Eunice can provide to you while you have our undivided attention this evening? All right. I think I sent the question. Do you see it? Hmm, Silva, no, I saw that, but I don't see your question. Can you try again? I'm looking to see if maybe I missed it. Yeah, Sylvia, if you would. Okay. Okay. Not a problem at all. Oh, I found your question. I apologize. There's like two, there's a Q&A portion and a chat section. I found it. It's in the Q&A. So don't worry about retyping it. Okay. You were in New York City. Awesome. I was just there a little bit ago. And I have told that the courts here are moving to digital devices in the courtroom first paper. How is Florida Coastal School of Law embracing these changes? So, um, uh, that is not something that I'm 100% sure if the Florida courts are also embracing. So each court is going to be different when it comes to, or each state is really different in regards to what it does. Um, I do know that, you know, I have a friend who works at the public defender's office down here, and I know they work off of iPads. Um, we try to ensure that the courtrooms that we have here on campus are up to date when it comes to technology. We do embrace any ch changes in technology, but for us, it ha will have to be in line with whatever Florida is doing, um, since that's where our we are located and where most of our students are practicing. Um, but you're in New York City. We have a lot of students who come from New York City, whether they decide to stay here or move back. Um, if you're interested in talking to you know, any alumni up there, um, and any of you in the areas that you're located in, to learn a little bit more about their experience and their transition, we'd be happy um, to do that. But if that is something that the Florida courts were looking at doing, that's definitely something we would embrace as well. If you look at units, you know, I mean, if you look at our courtrooms here, um, the technology is very in line with the courtrooms in the Florida courts. 
Yeah, absolutely. I was going to say if there is any kind of change when it comes to procedure by uh, the Florida courts, uh, I'm sure we will be the first to uh, implement it. All right. Is there any other question before we kind of start wrapping up? As you're, you guys are thinking about uh, potentially the last few questions, uh, I just want to thank uh, all of you again uh, for uh, joining us in today's webinar. I think uh, we had a record number uh, attendance uh, for this webinar, so thanks again for doing that. Um, you're very welcome, Stephen. Thanks for joining us. Um, so. Uh, and I also want to thank uh, Megan. Uh, Megan, thank you very much for uh, taking this on a very short notice and uh, coming in for uh, Dean Cardenas. Uh, yeah, again, uh, apologies for having to change the schedule a little bit on that. But uh, like I promised you, uh, you did receive a lot of information. Uh, most of what is there uh, need to be uh, what, what there is to, uh, to know about Florida Coastal and where it's going in terms of directions. Um, well, th thanks all of you guys. Linda, th thank you. Thanks for your questions. Uh, um, can we do have one more. Is that okay, Eunice, if I do that quick? Oh, yeah, jump in. Okay, um, so I know, Linda, you asked about the three pillars again, um, so I'll go ahead and list those for you. Our first pillar is student outcome centered. That second pillar is serving the underserved. And our third pillar is practice ready. Um, I also see that someone asked about access to the recording. As soon as we're done here, Eunice uh, will get access to the recording. We are currently recording this, and he will ensure that all of you receive it. And you can let your friends know, because he'll probably get it posted on our YouTube video as well. So when you need to see us again and wonder uh, what's going on here at Florida Coastal, you can always check back and see all the great information that was shared this evening. Yes, absolutely. Uh, talking about uh, our YouTube channel, all of our webinars uh, are going to be available in our YouTube channel. You can find us on YouTube. Just search for Florida Coastal School of Law. There are a uh, number of very helpful uh, webinars and videos available on a variety of subjects. So definitely check those out. Um, I'm very happy to hear uh, Sylvia um, um, and uh, like, like Megan said, uh, you will also all receive a link to this particular webinar uh, in your email after, uh, the, after the webinar is over and the recording uh, is over. I also want to take this opportunity to let you all know that two weeks from today, on August 23rd, we're going to have yet another webinar. Uh, the next one is titled, Why Jacksonville? Uh, Why Now? Um, as the title suggests, it's going to be focused on the city of Jacksonville. I know a number of you guys are from Jacksonville. So uh, for those of you who are from Jacksonville, it's not a bad idea to attend that and learn more about the city you're from because uh, we are most likely going to have guest speakers from Visit Jacksonville or Visit Jacks rather. Um, and uh, they are uh, a treasure of knowledge when it comes to Jacksonville. And those of you who are not from Jacksonville, I definitely encourage you uh, to attend that webinar. Uh, like I told you uh, guys at the top of the webinar, I uh, moved here from Utah, Salt Lake City. I had never been to Jacksonville before. And quite fr frankly, I hadn't heard much about the city either. I know we have famous cities here in Florida, like Orlando and Miami and Tampa, but uh, Jacksonville is that one uh, hidden gem in, in Florida. And I say that with, uh, with no bias. Jacksonville is a great city to live in. So make sure not to miss that webinar coming up two weeks uh, from today. Uh, with that, uh, Megan, if you don't have anything else to add, I just want to uh, go ahead and wish everyone uh, good luck. Uh, please, like Megan said, don't hesitate to reach out to our office with any question you might have. Keep an eye out for, for our applications becoming available. I know our spring 2018 is already available. So if you're looking to start in January, uh, check that out and send in your applications if they're ready to go. If you need any help with your applications, uh, from personal statement to um, letter of uh, recommendations to, to all uh, different corners of the application process, please 
uh, don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, we will be more than happy to help you. And uh, like I said, make sure to check out these webinars and the schedules. I'll send out invitations before um, before we set them up, uh, like this one, as you receive the invitations. And with that, I just want to uh, thank everyone again and wish you all a very great evening. Thank you, and uh, we will see you all soon, hopefully, in about two weeks or so in another uh, webinar. Uh, from myself, uh, Megan, and the rest of the team uh, in the admissions, uh, thank you and have a great night. Bye, everyone.